Hello students, welcome back to our course Environmental Modeling and Simulation. In today's lecture, we are going to continue our discussion on transportation of contaminant through groundwater and we are going to use the conceptual model that we worked on in the previous lecture to make a, to write a mathematical model. So, let us get started. In the previous lecture, the conceptual model that we had told us that the concentration of the contaminant will depend upon how it is transported through the groundwater through the aquifer. And we know that there are four things that would be important in this context. The first is mass transport by the groundwater. The second is diffusion in all the directions, same thing with mass transport in all direction. The third thing was retardation due to sorption to the soil. And then the fourth thing was decay degradation of the contaminant. So, we are going to start modeling this exactly like we did with, uh, with air pollution. So, let us say the flow of groundwater is in from left to right and the contaminant let us say was first injected at one particular location. So, this is where the source of the contaminant is. So far, it is not very different from the Gaussian plume modeling that we did in the previous lectures on air contaminant. Uh, there are few assumptions we are making right away. The first assumption is that the source is a point source which may not always be the case, but let us say we are dealing with a dry cleaner and they are releasing, they are allowing seepage of certain contaminants into the groundwater. The dry cleaning shop itself is not a singular point or narrow like a chimney top, but in context of the area that the plume will spread into the plume of the contaminants in the groundwater will spread into, we can assume that the dry cleaner is actually a point source. So, it is small enough relatively. So, that is one assumption we are making. So, we have a point source, we have a direction of flow. So, let us say the flow velocity uh, in the direction of the groundwater flow is v x, in y direction it is v y, in z direction it is v z. So, very similar to the uh, air quality modeling, we are going to take a parallelopide. So, very small parallelopide with dimensions del x, del y and del z. And we are again going to look at the mass transportation through each of the faces and diffusion through each of the faces. And I am not going to repeat what we have already done, but when you account for only diffusion and dispersion, your model will look something like this. Del m by del t the rate at which the mass of the contaminant in the parallelopide, this given parallelopide is changing with time is equal to the, uh, the diffusion plus mass transport bulk action. And then when you put these together, it will be, this is in x axis sees the concentration of the contaminant in the parallelopide, y axis and then the z axis. Now, we also need to account for the mass transport. So, in x axis we have v x del c by del x, in y v y del c by del y and then in z we have del c by del z. Now, few assumptions that we should make. Uh, the, we have taken x axis as the direction in which groundwater is moving. We can assume there is no vertical velocity. We have already assumed that the aquifer is not very big in the vertical scale. Uh, however, that does not have to be true. This could be a case of infinitely leaky aquifer. So, infinitely leaky, leaky aquifer is an aquifer that is unconfined, it is leaking in all directions. So, this may not always be the case, but um, safely we can assume that Vy and Vz are 0. Then our model becomes much simpler, we are left with diffusion in 3 directions and mass transport in 1 direction. Now, let us look at the LHS, the left hand side of this equation, we have del m by del t. Now, del m by del t, very simply, we in past we have written m is equal to concentration into velocity. Now, here we have something else, we have retardation going on, sorption to the soil. So, we need to multiply the mass, so the mass of the contaminant in the parallelopide 
will be affected by the retardation factor. So instead of m is equal to cv, what we get is m is equal to rdcv, where rd is the retardation factor. Now here we are assuming that this is linear sorption, which is not necessarily always the case. But if we use this linear sorption, what we get on left hand side is rd del c by del d. Okay, so this is our model. We need to get rid of v y and v z because we are saying that there is no mass transportation in y, v y and v z because v y v z are zero. So no mass transportation in y and z direction. Mass transportation is only happening in x direction. Okay, so remember this is a two D model. We are assuming there is no much have not much happening in z direction either. This should be d z. Okay, uh, now. What we can do is we need to integrate this, we need to put boundary conditions. So let's discuss some boundary conditions. In case of air model, so remember our air model was a chimney releasing contaminants that are being transported downwind by the, by the wind action and there is also dispersion happening in all direction predominantly in y and z but in all direction. And the boundary condition we applied was that the net net contaminant that has been released by the chimney would be equal to all the contaminant downwind from y extending from minus infinity to infinity, z going from 0 which is ground level to infinity all the way. So for all excess, this was the boundary condition that worked in case of air pollution. Now in case of groundwater. Let us take two different cases in groundwater. So in case of air contamination, in case of chimney, one of the assumption was that the smoke coming out of the chimney, smoke coming out of the stack is coming out at, an, at a constant emission rate. So in groundwater also we can have two situations. One is we have a pulse of contaminant that has been injected into the groundwater. So let us take this as the first situation where we have contaminant mass injected in a pulse. And the second scenario where we have continuous injection. So continuous injection is similar case as that of uh, chimney stack where there was continuous constant emission of uh, contaminant. So let us take the first example, first case. Sorry, let us take the first case here where there is singular pulse injection of contaminant mass into the groundwater and it is uh, the contamination is released mass per length. Remember, this is a 2D model, so we are looking at mass per length. And once that injection has been made, we stop and now we want to track how this plug or how this uh, contaminant which has been released in groundwater is transporting through the groundwater and then our, um, our boundary condition becomes that the net mass that has been released, so the net mass that has been released into the groundwater, so mass by m by l is constant into the actual length of the aquifer is equal to the net concentration of contaminant downstream. Before we integrate with this boundary condition, we need to also account for the fourth part of our conceptual model. Right now we have sorption here, we have diffusion here, dispersion here, the fourth part is missing, the fourth part is decay. So we need to have a decay term here. Now um, let us say our contaminant is undergoing first order decay. It is quite common in environmental situations, especially when the contaminant concentration is limited not very high. So it is undergoing first order decay. So lambda concentration of the contaminant, remember we decided concentration of contaminant would be, they would it would have a retardation factor to it. So lambda r d c. Now this is our full mathematical model that we need to integrate with our boundary condition. And when we integrate this model, what we get is this concentration of the contaminant at any given point, this is a lengthy model so I am going to take a while to write it down. I can write this as mass, mass dash because the unit is mass per length. Remember this is a 2D model divided by 4 pi nt. n is effective porosity 
t is time under root dx dy dx dy remember are the diffusivity constants in x and y direction e to the power so far it still resembles the gaussian plume model minus x minus v t whole square by v is the effective seepage velocity in the direction of the groundwater flow by 4 dx t minus y square by 4 dy t minus lambda t. So, notice that this is still resembling the Gaussian plume model that we studied in the uh, air quality, not air quality sorry, this is still resembling the Gaussian plume model that we studied in our previous lectures. There is an exponential term, inside the term we have some negative power and um, and we have the two dimensions in which the flow is happening x and y because we are assuming in z direction it is all constant, it is all homogeneously mixed and there are differences. The first difference is that we have the first obvious difference that I see is that we have a decay term here now. Remember uh, this can also be rewritten as This can also be re rewritten as this. So basically we have the first order decay of the contaminant and then we have the diffusion and this uh, mass transport part of the model. Dispersion multiplied by decay. So we have two factors here, one is the dispersion factor which resembles the Gaussian bloom model we started previously for air multiplied by decay. You can already start guessing that in case of a chimney, if we are releasing a contaminant that undergoes first order decay, we can expect something like this to be multiplied to the dispersion model that we have, the Gaussian bloom model. Another interesting thing to note here is that for x, we have x minus vt whole square. vt here talks about the horizontal transport, the bulk of the bulk transport of the contaminant in the, horizon, uh, in the direction of the groundwater. The other very important term that we have here is n, n refers to porosity. Now effective porosity, remember v is the seepage velocity, the velocity at which the wat, uh, water is seeping through. Okay. So this is the integration that, uh, this is the model we get with the boundary condition in case, this is the case when we have singular pulse injection of contaminant. Now in case where the contaminant is being constantly released into the ground water, the, the boundary condition becomes different. It says that integration of in case the contaminant is being constantly released into the ground water like uh, constant emission rate or constant injection rate. In that case the integration looks different because now our boundary condition has changed. Now here. Uh, it is slightly complicated uh, the result we get after injection, but it is a very important um, model. So, I am going to write it down. So, this is the second scenario constant injection. Here the integration because the boundary condition has changed looks like this. C is equal to F dash M and I will tell you what F dash M is e to the power x by b. This is a very complicated integration. So, I am introducing new variables and I will tell you what b is, what f dash m is divided by 4 pi n. So, this still looks very similar to the previous situation under root dx dy. And then we have a function here, function of u and r by b. So, let me tell you what r by b is, what f dash m is. So, b here, b is 2 times diffusivity constant in x direction divided by seepage velocity and then in order to define our w we also need to define another uh, variable here this one which is equal to 1 plus 2 b lambda is the decay rate remember divided by seepage velocity and u we have u here is r square r is the effective distance downstream. 
So from the site of injection to where we are interested that effective distance is r. So r square for this term here again as I said this is a very complicated model so it is easier to define new terms to write it. Horizontal diffusivity by time is u. So u is constantly changing it is a function of time. Okay. Now I am going to define r which is effective distance it is given by square root of x square plus ratio of dx to dy diffusivity in x direction to y into y square here this here okay. Now let us define w which is a function of u and r by b r by b is very important factor we will see shortly. So w which is a function of u and r by b is given by integration from u to infinity of 1 by theta e to the power minus theta plus r square 4b square theta d theta. Now this is known as Hunter-Schwell function. Now this is relevant for a leaky inf infinitely leaky aquifer. I want to share a very simple insight here with you. We changed the boundary condition from a single pulse injection to a continuous injection and all of a sudden our model is much more difficult to just even write it in one go. We have a new function known as Hantushwell function which is valid for small levels of r by b. As long as r by b is small it works but in cases in real life cases mm, uh, in case of grave contaminations sometimes r r by b will be large it will not work this Huntush model well function will not work very well so we need different functions. So just by changing a small part of our boundary equation instead of having singular pulse injection we have continuous injection into an infinitely, infinitely leaky aquifer and the integration changes completely. What this should tell you is that it is very as long as you can write conceptual models like one we have here as long as you can write these models. And you can make you uh, you can get help of your friends in mathematics department or mathematicians to integrate your model you can figure out what the model would be. Let us say this is not a first order decay. So in that case this would change it is no longer first order decay. So both in case of pulse injection and continuous injection your model will look different. So there is no point cramming this model up. I am not expecting you to remember this or to remember what happens here. What I do expect you to understand is how to derive these models. Now in the exam that we will have for this course I do not expect you to be expert on integration to be able to derive these complex integrals of our, um, of our very simple conceptual models. But what I will test you on is can you write these models? Can you write mathematical expressions of your conceptual models? Can you modify them? Now here for example let us say we assume that now we are at steady state. So if we are at steady state then del c by del t will be equal to 0. So if in the exam I say okay this is your mathematical model that you have derived before integrating it what happens when we are at steady state? So you should be able to take this equation and put it equal to 0. And let us say I give you some more assumptions or some more information about diffusion and dispersion overall or decay of the contaminant you should be able to use these. Please do not expect uh, please do not worry about remembering these models the constant uh, the constant injection the continuous injection or the pulse injection I do not expect but I expect you to understand. I also expect you to understand how these models have been used which we will discuss in the next lecture where I will give you an example where scientists actually use this particular model the constant rate of injection model for studying hexavalent chromium contamination of groundwater which happened over multiple years. So they actually model for thousands of days and then they had data for those thousands of days because there were multiple published studies done on that aquifer and then they compared this data that the model gave to the actual data. Which brings me to another point once you do derive a mathematical model like this once you do derive a mathematical expression like this it is not the end of your modeling. Remember this mathematical expression was derived after multiple assumptions which may or may not be accurate for a given aquifer. In that case if you have real data from 
your observation, then we need to do the next step which is model verification. So, you need to verify that your model is correctly predicting the values compare it with by comparing it with the values the observations that you get from real environment. This is a very important part of uh, modeling. So, coming back to the steps of modeling first step was we conceptualized. So, we had a conceptual model and then we had a mathematical expression of it and then we applied boundary conditions integrated it and other conditions and then we integrated it and next step we need to verify the model. We need to do model verification. If our model the output given by a model does not match the observations it means we need to go back to our drawing board to our conceptual model to our mathematical model to the boundary conditions and we need to reevaluate that maybe our boundary condition is not that what we are assuming is the boundary condition is not really what is happening or maybe we are assuming first order decay, but it is zero order decay or second order decay. Maybe we are assuming the retardation is in this range, but it is not. So, we need to go back and we need to improve our model until the output uh, given by a model is a close approximation of what we are observing in the ground. There is one more step here, which I have not covered so far, but I am interested in covering it, you know, especially in our practical classes and definitely before we start simulation is sensitivity analysis. And I think now is a very good time to talk about sensitivity analysis. Just brief introduction. Sensitivity analysis is when we are trying to do parameter when we are looking at the parameters in the model. So, let us say here in this model we have lots of parameters you know we have effective porosity of the soil, we have diffusion constants and then uh, we have R, we have B which depend upon seepage velocity, diffusivity constant in x direction. So, we have all these parameters like diffusivity constant, seepage velocity and then uh, effective porosity. Now, it can be very hard to get the exact value of these parameters. Sometimes we get a range sometimes we get an estimate with some error. So, we have some value plus minus some error in the uh, in our estimates of these parameters. We want to know the how much the error that we are expecting in the value of the parameters will affect the output. So, maybe when we are doing model verification the difference we are seeing in the observed and predicted value is not because of a mistake or an error in our model, but because it is an it is a mistake in estimating a particular parameter in the model. So, this is where sensitivity analysis comes in. What we do is keeping everything else constant, we change the values of the parameter and when and then we see how sensitive the model is to the changes in the parameter, which reminds me of bifurcation, but this is not what but this is not bifurcation that we are doing here. We are looking at how sensitive the model is to each parameter. Let us say we run this and we realize, so let us go back to our conceptual model. We do sensitivity analyses of our continuously injected contaminant, this model where we are having con continuous injection of contaminant in the groundwater. We do sensitivity analyses and we find out that the first order decay depending because of the kind of contaminant it is the kind of flow the contaminant is undergoing is not really important. It is not an important parameter. So, what we can do is we can go back to our mathematical model our conceptual model and we can get rid of this term saying that ok this is we know that decay is happening, but we modeled we got our integrated uh, model we did sensitivity analysis and we saw that this decay is not important. So, we can get rid of it and we can make our model computationally much easier. So, this is where sensitivity analysis comes in. It also tells us which parameter is more important. Should I spend more money trying to get the exact value of seepage velocity or should I spend uh, you know divert more resources in trying to get the hydraulic gradient or um, retardation factor which factor which parameter is more important to estimate accurately is also something we get out of sensitivity analysis. And I am going to run very simple models in our practical um, demonstrations and I am going to show you how to do sensitivity analysis on both R which is an open source software and on MATLAB. 
In the next lecture, we are going to look at this model where we have the boundary condition of constant injection, continuous injection at a constant rate. And we are going to look at re a real life situation where hexavalent chromium was uh, the contaminant in the groundwater. Hexavalent chromium is quite stable in groundwater. So uh, there is no first order decay. So this model will become a little simpler. We are going to see how people modeled it, verified it, got the values of parameter and compared it with the actual observations. All right, students, this is all for today's class. See you in the next lecture. Thank you.